Hey, welcome back. We are slowly moving closer to Halloween, and while the aliens infestation video was a good warm up, I think it's time we really start getting into the Halloween spirit. I mentioned back in that video that I don't really consider that game to be a true Halloween game. Like, sci fi corridors doesn't really do it for me. Well, this game I think might actually be a step in the right direction. We have a survival horror game with zombies, ghosts, monsters, mad scientists, all set inside a massive insane asylum during a dark and stormy night. Oh, hell yeah. This sounds perfect for Halloween. Dementium the Ward. Dementium the Ward is a 2007 first-person shooter survival horror game developed by the studio Renegade Kid, made exclusively for the Nintendo DS. Yeah, what? For whatever reason, there are a number of FPS games made just for the DS, which I guess kind of makes sense, because like FPS games are popular and the DS itself was popular, so why not combine them? I mean, that sounds good on paper, but in practice, the DS had the processing power of a fucking toaster. Sure, it's easy to run 2D games, but a 3D FPS game? Man, it was always a compromise. This sadly didn't prevent companies from trying, leading to some very predictable results. I'm still kind of shocked at the manpower and resources that it took to make these games even remotely playable. Although the definition of playable is still up for debate for a lot of these games, I've seen the Call of Duty ports on the DS. Those run at a PowerPoint level frame rate. But there were a few studios that managed to optimize their games well enough for them to run at friggin' 60 FPS. Yeah, 60. Something that not even a lot of console games managed to do at the time. Anyway, I've been talking about this game for long enough. Let's jump right into it. Chapter 1. Well, we start off with this really fast intro. This doesn't really feel like the opening to a story. It feels like a demo reel of all the monsters we're going to shoot at. Wee. Then the game actually starts. We wake up in a hospital bed in the middle of the night with thunder and lightning outside. Ooh, spooky. All we have is a key and a journal. More on that in a bit. So a survival horror game where we have amnesia and we're wandering through a dilapidated building full of monsters. Unique premise, huh? Okay, so we haven't even really begun the game, but I already need to talk about how I'm playing this game. If you couldn't tell already by the crisp footage, this is not being played on a real DS. It's through an emulator. The first time I played this game was through a real DS, and the way this game works, as did many FPS games on the Nintendo DS, because for fuck's sake people kept making them, is that the left D-pad moves around and the touchscreen was used for aiming. Again, just like Prime Hunters. However, unlike Prime Hunters, there is no alternate control scheme, meaning that the only way to play this game is by using the touchpad, which on an emulator translates to you having to drag your mouse around this tiny little window, basically mimicking a stylus. I mentioned how back when I was playing Prime Hunters, this control layout was borderline unusable, considering just how clunky it was through emulation, but that was Prime Hunters. Prime Hunters was a pretty fast-paced arena game. Dementium, luckily for me, is pretty slow-paced. It's not too intense. At least not early on. So at the very least, this isn't a huge barrier to entry. Like it would have been for Metroid. Also, I'm throwing this out there. If you notice my camera is a bit jittery, just remember that I am playing this game by dragging my mouse through a tiny second window, getting to the edge, and then moving my mouse back up so I can drag it some more. You may also notice my mouse cursor on the very right edge of the screen throughout the video, simply because that's me dragging my mouse over a little too far out of habit. In hindsight, I probably shouldn't have pointed that out, because now for the rest of the video, you're probably going to keep noticing it and be on the lookout for it too. Sort of like when you see a boom mic in a movie or show. You're better off not having been told. Happy Halloween. So we begin, and ah uh, ah uh, ah, uh, not so fast. This is a DS game, so even though the touchpad was used as basically a stand-in analog stick, it also serves as a second screen with additional info, mainly your HUD. Well, for most of this game, the top screen is going to be the one you want to see. So before I crop it out for the video, here's what the second window has. I've got a health meter straight out of Resident Evil, an inventory menu for me to swap between my weapons and my flashlight, a map that I have to find for each chapter in the game, an items window just to show the stuff that I've collected. Lastly, I have a notepad. This is honestly a unique inclusion. Remember, this is a touchpad, so what the game will occasionally do is throw information up on a wall or in a note somewhere that may be important for you to write down. So you just write it down, literally. We'll come back to that, but that's the bottom screen. Get a good look at it because I'll be switching to the top window from here on out. Alright, let's begin. This game starts off pretty suspenseful and slow, but I kind of like it. We slowly make our way into the hallway as we hear an intercom announcing that there's an emergency and everyone needs to evacuate. It's also dark, really dark, but we eventually get a flashlight. 
Oh my gosh, look at how they're pulling off the lighting. They clearly can't have a real-time dynamic light source, so instead they're simply enabling and disabling a low draw distance to give the illusion of it being super dark. They even do this for lightning too. God, this is almost adorable. I love just how much they're trying to make do with the hardware. Remember, frame rate of 60 on a friggin' DS. I will say, this is already the most mature rated DS game I've played so far. Aliens Infestation had its moments, but nothing compared to this. We have blood everywhere. Some corpses on the ground too. This does not look good. Then we finally get ourselves a baton. Oh geez, this really is not good. If there's no worse moment in a horror game where you finally get access to a weapon, that's a sign that the game is about to take off the training wheels. Well, as expected, we do a bit of wandering and find our first enemy encounter. A zombie ghoul looking dude with metal prongs sticking out of his eyes, a mouth that might be filled with sharp teeth, or maybe those are stitches and it's sewn shut. It's hard to tell with how low res the model is, and his friggin' rib cage is split open and you can see his heart. Yeah, I'm already getting Silent Hill vibes with this game. Actually, fun fact, this game was actually meant to be a Silent Hill game. Apparently the story is that Renegade Kid, the developers, pitched this game, or at least some early concept build of it to Konami as a DS Silent Hill game, but Konami rejected it. So the devs decide to make it their own thing. Well, something is telling me in the back of my head that we're gonna find out why Konami probably rejected this game. I don't know. Oh man, this combat. Granted, I only have a melee weapon, but even still, this is not good. I'll talk more about combat once I get some real guns. Moving on, I now have a map and I can do a bit of exploring. Huh, a bathroom with murderer written on the mirror. Yeah, that's spooky, but I've seen worse public restrooms. Huh, guy just laying on the floor. Oh yeah, I'm sure he totally won't get up. Yep. Oh shit, he's still attacking me while decapitated. Which brings up a good point. I was thinking that these guys are just zombies, or at the very least, like resurrected ghouls, yet even a headshot doesn't kill them. So whatever's keeping them alive is something supernatural. I guess maybe the zombies here could follow Return of the Living Dead logic. Well, the silver lining is I now know never to trust dead bodies on the ground. Yep, you all get a whacking as well. I'm actually kind of enjoying the mood right now. At least so far. The game's quiet, there's not a lot of enemies, exploring is kind of fun. Ew, look at these cockroaches. I want to say these guys probably have a few more polygons than the roaches in Half-Life, but I'm still not sure. But yeah, exploration so far is pretty solid. Even though the combat is a bit lackluster, I'm still actually a little immersed in this game, which is really rare for the DS. Chapter 2. On to the Roof. Well, already I'm being reminded that this is a DS game. Wow, check out that draw distance. Okay, this part is kind of annoying. These fucking zombie guys keep crawling up over the railing around every corner. Oh, damn, I'm losing a decent amount of health here. Well, there's a blood trail leading to one of the doors. I wonder what's inside. You want me? Come on over and get me free cats, right? A little closer. Wait, you're not one of them? Oh, man, we gotta go! Yeah, was there any shred of doubt that the one human survivor we meet in a survival horror game wasn't going to just die? This might actually be the fastest character reveal and death I've seen in a game, period. I clocked it. 10 seconds. 10 seconds where we meet a human survivor who's shooting at us, thinking we're another monster, then he realizes we're friendly, and then he gets killed by a zombie. Well, now we have his gun. Perfect. Thanks for your sacrifice, random guy. You won't be forgotten. Also, I find it hilarious how this guy had his gun trained perfectly at the door, the only way inside this room, and yet a zombie managed to materialize itself right behind him. And that zombie had to have at least teleported in or something. Like, there is no other way inside this room. I checked. No window or anything. Come on, game. I guess they could be necromorphs. Well, keeping on with the tradition of every survival horror game I've played, and just about any FPS game in general, is right after I've gotten my brand new gun, I immediately put it away so I can save all the ammo for it. Chapter 3 This is arguably the true start of the game. It's when it introduces a ton of mechanics, and it becomes the first area in the game where you're kinda left on your own. Starting off, we have a little bit of exploration, which I'm actually really enjoying, believe it or not. More combat, which, eh, is still pretty basic. We get introduced to a handful of new enemies in this chapter as well. Specifically, these creepy, annoying worms that make baby crying sounds. And these shrieking, floating heads that are really unnerving. And we get to a puzzle. 
you know what, I think now's a good time to talk about the puzzles in this game, which I genuinely think is a solid feature. The puzzle solving in this game is really simplistic, but it has enough neat features to it that make it pretty fun, especially since you have the journal. For example, this puzzle had me overthink it, showing the keys of a piano and then a piano in the next room. I thought the placement of these hands had something to do with the keys, as evident by my drawing in the journal, except it was far simpler than I thought. Yeah, dead. D-E-A-D. -E yep. There's a few more puzzles later in the game that are just as easy, but they're still pretty fun to solve. A couple riddles that require a little bit of thinking, stuff where you gotta read between the lines and count some letters. There are some great ones that actually force you to explore the room you're in, specifically by counting objects or stuff that are hidden throughout the room. For example, in this puzzle, I have to deduce a code, but to do that, I've gotta count these various props individually, which will then give me some sort of password. Hey, it's a little simplistic, but I am more than okay with the game letting me explore the level. And yeah, the journal is a pretty neat gimmick, I'm serious. You have limited paper, so you gotta jot down only the most important stuff, door codes, locations. I kinda wish you were able to draw on the map as well, like being able to outline rooms you wanna check out, or rooms you haven't visited yet. But still, these puzzles are kinda fun. I like this. Chapter 4 Okay, right away I'm gonna stop listing off every chapter. There's like 16 of them. And we're gonna be breezing through quite a few of them. Ooh, spooky ghost girl in an elevator. What is this, fear? Chapter 4 is pretty much just more of chapter 3. We get a new gun, a shotgun, and we also face our first boss. Yeah, this guy is very easy. You basically just have to keep shooting on him while also trying to avoid his attacks. The way that bosses in this game work is that if you shoot at them and you land a hit, he'll briefly take damage, but then he'll also be invulnerable for a few seconds. So you just gotta wait in between your shots. This game also gives you so much friggin' ammo that it's never really a challenge. Yeah, see, he's not too tough. Oh man, this next level is a big friggin' tease. Up until this point, I've been mostly indoors running through hallways, and now I gain access to a courtyard, and there's also a creepy church. Oh man, this is such a nice change of pace. But nope, we need three pieces of a photograph to answer a door code, so we immediately go back inside. Ah. <sighs> I kind of want to bring up the graphics. What can I say? It's a first person shooter running on the DS. I talked about it back during my Prime Hunters episode, but the DS was such a measly little console. It apparently manages to just barely hit N64 levels of fidelity, but scaled down to the resolution of 192p. Hey, for all of you hardware purists who get irked at the idea of an emulator, just be glad that I'm running this upscaled to almost HD. Otherwise, this is what the video would look like. So every game on here that wasn't 2D had to make a lot of visual sacrifices, mainly through having low poly models and very low res textures that become pretty much just pixel art. But yeah, I'm repeating some of the same stuff I said in the Prime Hunters video. Cause honestly, I think some of these graphics have actually aged pretty well, at least unintentionally. And I think what helps is just how simplistic they are. Of course, this game is nowhere near on the level of Prime Hunters. That game genuinely holds up visually, because it was a total graphics powerhouse on the DS. Even if I had mixed feelings on that game, I can safely say its graphics are still awesome. But Dementium, uh, it's way more simplistic than Prime Hunters. And the more I play this game, the more I see what they're doing for shortcuts. At a first glance, it looks decent. The fact that all the textures have to be low res means that there's a heavy use of pixel art. And hey, pixel art is timeless. Low poly models are used heavily. However, rooms are usually filled with so many props and pieces of furniture that they actually look pretty nice. You'll see stuff like tables and chairs and beds all scattered around. This is a pretty good effort. Even though you can very clearly see the engine limitations, I think the devs did a commendable job. It manages to look pretty good. I have seen plenty of other FPS games on the DS, so I know how empty and boxy games can look on it. So here, this is a very commendable job, at least most of the time. The DS was an interesting console because it had super low processing power, yet it sold like hotcakes. Every kid wanted one, so developers were incentivized to develop for it. But to do that, they had to resort to really old school graphics techniques. So with the DS, you have this odd collective throwback towards old graphics techniques. It all reigned supreme on a console in the middle of the 7th gen. The DS was a fascinating phenomenon. So Dementium has what's basically a pseudo 5th gen visual art style, and as a result, it looks like a dated PS1 game. Hey, you know what, if someone back in 1998 tried to make a first person survival horror game on the PS1, it probably wouldn't look too dissimilar to this. And considering just how nostalgia crazy we are right now, with tons of indie games going for that very PS1, N64, old low poly art style, I think Dementium and games like it have aged very well. Even if the graphics aren't that good in regards to fidelity, the art style is at least pretty decent visually. 
I think my only complaint would be the lighting. Again, it's very clear that they had to downgrade the lighting by just having none of it, because I'm pretty sure if they even attempted some fear tier lighting, this game would make a DS friggin' explode. Although despite that, you compare this game to Prime Hunters, it's no comparison. I mean, colorful lighting would have been nice for a spooky Halloween game, but eh, that's just me. Chapter 6 Oh god, chapter 6. This is easily the longest chapter in the whole game. There's a lot that happens here. First, there's a locked case that requires three keys. Keys that I do not have. I also run into a swarm of bugs that actually do quite a bit of damage to me. Fuck, who let the mosquitoes in? There's also a fucking boss fight with this guy wearing a gas mask, with a chain gun connected to his arm, grenades slung around his chest, all the while he's racing around in a fucking wheelchair. Happy Halloween, everybody. This is also when I started noticing a really bad trend in the game so far. A lot of repeating rooms, hallways, and floors. So far, out of the six chapters in this game, four of them have all taken place inside these copy-paste asylum hallways and rooms. They all look identical. Yeah. Well, it looks like we're already gonna have to talk about level design. If there's one word I can use to describe it, it's boxy. Literally. Every room is a box. So is every hallway. Every corner. Just a lot of right angles and rectangles. Now alone, this of course isn't too bad. I mentioned earlier how good the devs were at putting in just the right amount of props and detail, and honestly this does a good job at keeping areas visually interesting. Hey, I was immersed for the first few levels of this game, but as the hour mark moves by, and as I move on to more and more chapters, it really started to wear down on me. The same rooms, the same corridors, sometimes just painted with a different color. That's it. By pure coincidence, I was actually going to compare this game to another DS FPS title, and in doing so, I was about to mention the game Moon, a sci-fi action puzzler with a very similar level design, being very low poly, boxy, and repetitious. Hey, I thought the comparison was pretty solid. Well, lo and behold, I discovered that the developer who made this game were the same ones behind Moon. Wouldn't you know? Moon is a very similar game that had an interesting premise, some solid mechanics, but is just overall let down by pacing and weak levels. I actually think Dementium, at least mechanically, is far stronger than that game. As weird as that sounds. Like I said before, with how simple the gameplay is, it could totally work as a survival horror FPS game. So long as you keep it slow and you focus on puzzles. This could have been a pretty solid game if the level design was up to par. Which, sadly it isn't. This is definitely a case where I think the devs put in way too much padding, and should have stuck with a simple, smaller game that had more open-ended floors and levels. Like through every chapter of this game, you'll wander through an area, do very minimal exploration, maybe a puzzle if you're lucky, and then on to the next chapter. It is shockingly linear. No, this isn't fun at all. Personally, I think if you're making a game with a very limited budget and you can't do super complex diverse levels, then simply focus on a good handful of levels first. Give me a sprawling single floor of the asylum, with backtracking, multiple routes, locked rooms that need to be opened, and give me a ton of puzzle solving. Hey, this game is like Resident Evil or Silent Hill. Do what those games do. Give me quality, not quantity. God, well I find all three keys. It's also worth pointing out that I think you don't actually need to backtrack to that case. It'd say you could just keep on playing until the next chapter, but not me. I'm gonna go grab what's inside. Also, even though I talked about it earlier, this kind of backtracking is terrible. You see, this is an open-ended backtracking. Unlike a game like Resident Evil, where you think you'd be able to unlock a previously locked door that might loop back around faster to the entrance area, here, you have to hoof it all the way back through the level the same way you progress through it, with the enemies you just killed ready to respawn. Yeah, this, uh, this isn't fun. But in the end, it was all worth it because I find myself a buzzsaw, the best friggin' weapon in the whole game. My baton from earlier was a pretty garbage melee weapon, so I was mostly expecting to stick with guns for this playthrough. But this thing is literally a game changer. You're still at the mercy of enemies with ranged attacks, but anyone that gets too close is fucking toast. This thing is what carried me through most of the game. I was having trouble with the combat, so this was a blessing when I found it. You know what, let's talk about the combat. Uh, yeah, it's serviceable. Not amazing, although that's about on par with most survival horror games. There's actually quite a few weapons in this game, but you'll mostly be using two. The pistol and the shotgun. These are the workhorses. 
pistol for enemies that are at a slightly long range that also have low health, specifically these gross worms, and shotguns for guys up close. You can get your hands on some other guns later in the game, like a magnum revolver, an assault rifle, even a sniper rifle. The magnum is great, but there's barely any ammo for it. The assault rifle was kind of a disappointment because it does about as much damage as a pistol, and it also has this weird wind-up time to it where you hold the trigger and the fire rate slowly increases. So it doesn't feel like a rifle, it feels like a fucking minigun or something. The sniper is actually really good, because it has a night vision scope that lets you see in the dark, and while you can't move forward or backward while zoomed in, you can strafe with it. Although again, just like the Magnum, the game gives you very little ammo, and you only really get it near the end. Also, most enemies in this game are just bullet sponges. They just take a bunch of shots before they finally fall down, even if you shoot them in the head. Although one feature I noticed is with the zombie dudes, since headshots don't work on them. But what does work is if you manage to shoot their open heart. Yeah, this right here. If you manage to hit them there, even with a pistol, that's an insta-kill. Yeah, that's pretty neat. If only the aiming in this game was that easy. God, I hate touch controls. Another horrible inclusion is that enemies literally respawn when you leave and enter rooms. There's also a bit of randomness to it, where sometimes you'll clear out a room and coming back to it, it'll stay empty. Other times you'll walk into an adjoining room, walk back, and every single zombie you killed in it will be standing back up again. Fucking fantastic. What also doesn't help is that ammo does not replenish. That shit is permanently gone. So yes, you can theoretically lose all of your ammo in this game if you're a shit player. Once again, this is why the buzzsaw is king. Alright, we're on to chapter 7, but this is about the point in the game where everything started to blend together. This is right around the halfway point of the game, and really nothing notable happens. So I'm going to be condensing a ton of stuff. The only noticeable thing that happens here is that we hear some creepy little girl whisper to us. There's also an HR Geiger nightmare room that's kind of annoying. And yeah, more aimless wandering in repeated hallways. Oh god, this level design's going to kill me. Okay, this game was starting to wear on my nerves earlier. Now it's full on making me sick of playing it. There's no denying it. This game has become way too repetitive. Not just in gameplay, but in map design. If you want to even call it that. I was actually going to label this part as exploration in my script, but I realized that I wasn't doing so much exploring as I was just walking down the same copy-paste corridors over and over. I honestly think that once you finish the first chapter in this game, you've pretty much seen every interior corridor. It's funny because some areas do have decent exploration, like where you're able to find side rooms and you get to find health and ammo. Except it was at this point in the game where I really started to notice that the levels are losing their open-endedness and are now becoming way more linear. It's like the level designer gave up halfway through, lost a ton of steam, and now he's phoning it in. Again, even if the game had super expansive detailed levels with a ton of exploration, secrets, and much better pacing, it would still have too many repeated environments. Every single single floor of this friggin' asylum is identical to the last, with just a slightly different layout and a different colored wallpaper. Ugh. Well, we're almost done with this thing, so let's get it over with. Back to the church. Well, we finally have the three pieces of the photograph, so we can finally progress into the guard tower. Then we just end up back inside. Ah, oh, damn it. Chapter 12. Oh, Jesus, not even an intro. This guy again. Honestly, he's still the same pushover he was when I first killed him. Well, the rest of the level is just more of the same. More screaming heads, more zombies. Oh man, this part of the game is really starting to drag out. I think the fact that they're already repeating boss fights was a sign that the devs might be padding for time. Oh, shh, a cutscene. Good evening. I'm Karina Phillips reporting from Redmore News. Our top story tonight. A 30-year-old woman was found shot dead in her home last night. Police were called to the scene after neighbors reported hearing gunshots from the home. Officers arrived at the scene to find an armed gunman standing over the victim's body. The confrontation resulted in the police firing gunshots and injuring the suspect. Officers found the victim's 8-year-old daughter unharmed in the home. They believe she may have witnessed the killing, but police are still investigating the scene. After the burn. <laughs> Okay, I think I'm getting an idea of what's happening in the plot department. First off, this game hasn't given me any plot so far. Just these random, out of context cutscenes. Honestly, this is the first cutscene in the whole game that actually has dialogue. But anyway, analyzing what's been going on so far, our character clearly has amnesia. But I think we're in an asylum for a reason. Perhaps because we're probably the murderer. Yeah, I'm guessing that the woman that was murdered was our wife, and this is our daughter who was the witness. 
I mean, that's the only hunch I have so far. This barely constitutes as a story. This game is just giving me table scraps, you guys. You have to bear with me on this. So Silent Hill fans, this probably isn't your kind of game for a deep story. I guess now that I remember that this game actually has a plot, I'm starting to wonder more about the world. Like, are these monsters unrelated? Or is this all some sort of illusion in our head? Like, I keep seeing my creepy ghost daughter, or maybe her whispering in her head? Is this a case where the whole story is actually us in a coma, and that none of this is real? Ah, uh, maybe. Maybe. I wouldn't put it past the game. So far, I haven't gotten really anything to indicate that this is real life. Probably the fact that I've yet to see a real person except for that one guy. That to me is a sign that nothing is, well, real. Which, uh, if the game's building to that twist, I don't know how I feel about it. I really don't like that. Eh, anyway, let's wait till the end. Maybe the game will surprise me. Moving forward, we have another fight with the wheelchair guy, who is a lot easier to fight now thanks to our sniper rifle and our magnum. After that, it's just more of the same, and this game is really starting to get to me with just how repetitive it is. You know what, let's talk about something else. The music, and sound design in general. Well, this section will be pretty short. The sound design in Dementium is very limited. Music is serviceable, except there's way too little of it, so it becomes grating after a while. Although this game actually has some real ambiance to it that's really decent. Like, there are areas in this game where you can hear the rain and thunder outside. That's some good creepy ambiance, and it's done really well. But like most DS games, there's just not enough of it. And for the most part, you'll spend the game either in utter silence or with an annoying repeated music track. Hey, just like with the last video I made, I'm adding my own spooky ambiance to this game, just so you guys have something to listen to instead. Back to the game. We're on the second to last chapter, and man, the developers have really given up. These levels are really cramped and linear. Also, I don't even get a map for this chapter because it's practically just a linear hallway. Which, uh, I guess that works for me. I'm ready to end this game as fast as the level designer is. The only thing of note is that we read another letter, this time from our wife to our daughter, basically saying that we aren't responsible for her death. So, yeah, maybe we're not the murderer. Maybe we were framed. But yeah, on to the last chapter. Chapter 16. This level is remarkably easy. Just a long red hallway with a few enemies scattered around, but eventually you get to the final boss. This doctor guy. Ah, oh, fuck, he's annoying. He's not particularly hard for the most part, like he doesn't have too much health and he doesn't do too much damage, except he has this one move he uses where he'll pick you up in the air and for just a brief second you're able to shoot at him, but then he pulls you close and your controls are completely locked. Then he knocks you to the ground and you lose two bars of health. This is no good, because this move, best I can tell, is unavoidable. So my only strategy right now is to shoot at him as fast as I can before I run out of health. Fuck me, what a fun boss battle. I sure love bosses that have an unavoidable fucking attack. Again, he's not that hard on his own. It's just that the devs gave him this fucking unfair attack that guarantees you'll lose at least a decent amount of health every single time. So it's like he's stupidly easy for half the battle, and then every 10 to 15 seconds he enters god mode. This is not a difficulty spike. This is just the developers not knowing how to balance a boss fight. Well, despite this, I still managed to kill him. With a single bar of health to spare, Jesus Christ. Oh? We wake up in our bed. Oh no, are you serious? It was all a dream, really? We're getting this cop-out ending? What is this, Realms of the Haunting? Oh, damn. Wait, maybe not. But as of 3.33 a.m., the patient has survived phase one of the operation. Jesus, what a way to end the game, with the main character getting fucking lobotomized. Prepare for phase two. And that's it. Well, great. I guess that is technically an ending. I still don't know what was going on. So wait, if the doctor was real, does that mean all the monsters were real as well? Or was that also a figment of our imagination? Because clearly the doctor didn't die when we shot at him. Ugh, I don't know. So that's Dementium the Ward. Man, what an experience. Best as I can tell, this game had a pretty famous reputation on the DS. Although, not much outside of the handheld. And probably for good reason. I know a lot of people who talked about this game as a genuine horror masterpiece. Hey, as far as DS games go, 
this is hard to beat, but compared to any other horror game, yeah, not even close. God, I really don't know what to say about this game other than that it was a bit of a disappointment, which is a shame because ironically, I think this game had way more potential than the devs even realized. A survival horror game with this style of gameplay and some of these mechanics could absolutely work. And by simply making a few alterations to the formula, cutting down on padding, having more story, focusing more on backtracking, open level design, exploration, and less about linear corridor shooting, then this could have been a fantastic survival horror game. The ingredients are there, it's just that the developers didn't know how to cook. Had this game cut two-thirds of its levels and simply gave me a map that was super expansive and detailed, like a Resident Evil, I would be totally down. Just give me some puzzles and more environments, I'm good. Seriously. It is really tedious, you guys. I can't express that enough. Just a constant repetition of the same rooms and environments, with the only difference being the color of the wallpaper. Like, this game is just a slog. There's a lot of games I've made videos on that really feel like prototypes more than anything. I think Dementium is one of them. And what's even more interesting is that unlike a lot of other games I've covered, this one actually has a sequel, Dementium 2. A sequel that came out almost three years later using similar mechanics but expanding upon the level design even further. And being popular enough to get a goddamn PC port. Oh man, this is really making it tough for me just to ignore. I'd want to write it off, but I simply can't. Because again, as flawed as this game is, there is potential locked away in here. And Dementium 2 might be the very horror game that I'm looking for. Ah, <sighs> alright, fine. I'll check it out. Eventually. Not this Halloween. I've already got plenty of other games taking my attention. I've had enough Dementium for one year. But yeah, that's the video. Kind of another disappointment, I'm afraid. But hey, that often describes my experience with the DS. Games that look cool and neat, but turned out to have crippling problems hidden underneath the surface. God, story of my life. Anyway, stay tuned next time for another 2D Metroidvania. Although I think this one is going to be a little more fun to cover. I think it's going to be a good Halloween treat. Otherwise, I'm Andy, and you guys have a good one. This is clearly reversed audio. I wonder what it means. Well, let's reverse it back. I am whispering now. I am whispering now. Oh.